Hello, everyone, and um, thank you very much for joining us today um, for a spe very special event. Um, my name is Shobhan Deer. I'm the current vi pre vice president of Oxford Climate Society, and I'm an engineer and a current PhD student at Oxford working to develop sustainable battery chemistries um, to support renewables. For those who don't know, Oxford Climate Society is a part of Oxford University, aiming to develop the next generation of informed climate leaders. In addition to our speaker events, we run educational programs throughout the year, including our award-winning School of Climate Change, which is currently teaching over 500 people from all over the world in this term school. We also run the world's largest student climate-run uh, climate journal Anthroposphere, and we're working with the university to develop net zero policies and incorporate climate onto the Oxford curriculum. So the theme of today's event is um, is what is the um, what is the the uh, is the theme of today's event is green recovery and global climate policy. I'm sorry, um, COVID nineteen has sparked the most severe economic crisis since the Great Depression, and with much of the world now experiencing a second wave and in lockdown, the crisis is far from over. The major stimulus and economic recovery packages being implemented in response by governments around the world present a pivotal moment for tackling climate change. The colossal investment in these packages could either redirect the global economy on a pathway to limiting warming below two degrees through a green recovery, or it could lock us into a fossil fuel based system for years to come, making it almost impossible to meet two degrees beyond which the consequences of climate change become much more severe. So given what is at stake, how can countries realize a green recovery? What policies should be prioritized as most effective in addressing climate change whilst also facilitating economic recovery? And given the stimulus programs which have already been implemented, are we on track for a green recovery at all? Finally, what will the implications of COVID-19 on the recovery be on global climate policy and COP26? To provide insight to these questions, I'm delighted to be joined by one of the world's leading energy experts, Dr. Fatih Birol. Dr. Birol is the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, the IEA, and for those who don't know, the IEA is the world's highest authority on energy, advising governments and industry on energy policy and solutions for climate change mitigation, energy security and energy affordability. Dr. Birol has led the IEA since 2015 and previously served as the Chief Economist and the Director of Global Energy Economics. He is responsible for the IEA's flagship World Energy Outlook publication, which is recognized as the most authoritative source for strategic analysis on global energy markets. He's the founder and chair of the IEA Business Council, and he also chairs the World Economic Forum's Energy Advisory Board and serves on the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Sustainable Energy for All. Dr. Brol is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Japanese Emperor's Order of the Rising Sun, the Order of the Polar Star from King of Sweden, and the highest presidential decorations from Austria, Germany, and Italy. So we're going to start this event with Dr. Brol giving a short speech with his thoughts on the topic, followed by some questions from myself, before opening it to questions from you, the audience, at the end. So if you have any questions for Dr. Brol, please write them in the live stream chat, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. So thank you so much, Dr. Barol, for joining us today. It's a real honor and a real privilege to, uh, to welcome you to this event. So I'll, to start, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dear, and it is uh, honor is mine. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, your uh, very important uh, event. And it is again, as I said, it's a privilege to be uh, with you and with your uh, colleagues uh, today. And I am uh, very happy that you, your colleagues are interested in this uh, topic, which I believe is critical for all of us uh, for many years to come. Now, I was thinking to uh, say two things now as a, a starter, but afterwards uh, I will be very happy to get any questions uh, you may have on energy and climate uh, issues, and we can have a nice uh, chat uh, uh, together. So first of all, the first thing I want to uh, elaborate is what is the impact of COVID on the energy sector? What happened to energy sector? Because we know what happened in, in terms of health. We know what happens in terms of economy. What happens in terms of energy sector? First, I should tell you, that it was the biggest shock that the energy industry ever had since the Second World War. Big shock. Big decline in energy demand, especially oil, 
coal and gas huge declines and in terms of total energy demand decline this year is seven times deeper decline compared to what we have seen after the financial crisis 2008-2009 such a huge uh, decline what we have seen uh, in fact is that uh, fossil fuels decline substantially but renewables especially solar and wind prove to be uh, COVID immune they did not uh, decline they increased a bit not as much as they did in the past but still we saw an increase in uh, renewable energy sources emissions the topic of today uh, which is the main cause of climate change this year they declined about seven percent and this is the deepest decline again since uh, decades normally uh, 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 mr deep we should be all happy that the emissions decline uh, because we we all want to see emissions going down and uh, down but i uh, think this decline is nothing to celebrate because it is not happening as a result of new technologies being part of the game or government policies pushing in the right direction it is happening because of the economic meltdown and the pandemic and if the governments do not put the necessary measures in place this decline in emissions will rebound with the global economy coming back on its uh, feet again so this is a, this would be a temporary decline not a structural uh, decline so this is the uh, station uh, the, uh, the impact of covid i should mention one more thing even though it, it may not be the topic because uh, but africa because i'm just coming a meeting that i organized with 20 African ministers about African energy station. In Africa today, about uh, 580 million people have no electricity. 580 million people. And the impact is the following in Africa. In the last seven years, number of people without having electricity was decreasing in the last seven years despite the population growth number of people who do not have access to electricity was decreasing but in 2020 as a result of the economic meltdown and what's happening with the governments and the people in the street it is again increasing a very bad trend i believe the access to energy the basic human right is a critical topic and i thought i should mention this also in the package of my first point the impact of COVID on the energy sector. And to finish by saying that this first uh, point, we will see global economy will rebound, energy will come back, but the scars of COVID on energy will be with us for many years to come. So this is the first point where we are uh, today. Second, the future. Now, we are all talking about the 2050 net zero, which means if we want to have a planet, which is more or less like uh, today in terms of the, the number and the intensity of the weather events, extreme weather events, in terms of the species uh, available around the world, uh, we have to bring the global emissions to uh, zero in 2050, which is 30 years from now. And many countries are making pledges. Uh, it started with the uh, EU, United Kingdom also said 2050, we are going to have net uh, zero. Japan, Korea, China came up with the important uh, uh, pledge. But I will come about this pledge, we can discuss later, but for me, to reach those 2050 targets, the critical, the nerve center, whether or not we have any single statistically 
significant chance to reach those targets is what we do in the next 10 years in terms of recovery policies. If we do not, if we do not in the recovery packages around the world, which should be around $20 trillion altogether, once in a generation in scale, if we do not put the right energy policies, emissions will uh, rebound and we will lose a huge opportunity to continue to see a structural decline of the emissions. Therefore, working with the IMF, we came up with a sustainable recovery plan to make suggestions to governments. And we told the governments, we know your main preoccupation today is economic recovery, creating firewalls around the economy and creating jobs. Millions of people are uh, being and will be unemployed, but also don't forget the climate. So we have chosen, we look at about 400 different energy policies. We have chosen three, four of them, which could help to boost economic growth, create jobs, but at the same time help to continue to see a decline in emissions. What are those? Renewables, solar and wind, this is number one, because they not only reduce the emissions, but they create jobs. Second, energy efficiency. For example, insulation of the homes, houses, buildings. This is a job creating machine, energy efficiency. Third, grids, electricity grids around the world to strengthening and modernizing uh, uh, those. And of course, at the same time, pushing the button for the innovative technologies ranging from batteries to uh, uh, carbon capture and storage from hydrogen to other uh, uh, technologies. So uh, some governments uh, did listen to us. Uh, some governments, we are still in discussion. But uh, I am rather hopeful that the more and more governments will put these policies in place uh, in order to give incentives in the basket of the trillion dollar packages in to the clean energy technologies. And some of those technologies should benefit incentives from governments. Even the governments do not care, wouldn't care about climate because they do create jobs. They give a boost to the economy. And it is the reason uh, we uh, work with the government to put them in uh, place uh, in the recovery packages. So, uh, to finish, maybe, and this is the second point I wanted to mention, green recovery. To finish, the, we are going through a, a period, the next three years, which will be a make or break in terms of reaching our 2050 uh, zero emission uh, goals. And it is interest of everybody to in football, we say, keep the eye on the ball. The, the ball is here next three years, and we have to keep the eye on the ball, and let's see if we are able to get something uh, out of it. There are governments who are taking the right uh, uh, policies, but some of them still we are uh, negotiating. These are some preliminary uh, remarks, uh, Mr. Dia, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, you or your colleagues, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was a fantastic speech. Um, I guess I'll start with the question Then you've said some you're working with and some have made some steps, but for countries which have actually announced green stimulus packages, um, particularly in the EU, uh, have they gone far enough um, or how, how, how are they doing so far? Now, if I can, uh, if I can, uh, put the countries in three categories. Some of them didn't announce anything yet. So we are discussing with them. Some of them announced very strong uh, uh, targets and started to implement them. And the third category announced the targets and still I need to be convinced that they will put the money and the right policies to implement them. I will put the EU in the third category they have genuine uh, uh, intentions to make a green recovery. They have very ambitious plans. We work with them together. And, uh, but I would like to see the budget, the money 
for those projects are going to be put in place, hopefully sometime soon. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so what, I'll, moving on, what do you think um, will be the most significant geopolitical challenges in the short and the long term for achieving the Paris two degrees target and, and net zero in 2050? So I uh, expect uh, that the more and more countries will uh, come up with pledges that they want to be a country which wants to reach net zero 2050. Now, what we do at IEA when a country makes something like that, we encourage them when, I, when they announce such a uh, target, we congratulate them, blah, 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 well done, etc. But this is the easiest part. There are two other parts. First one, uh, we want to see which policies, credible policies, they are going to put in place to reach those targets. For example, I am going to see that my solar uh, uh, capacity will need to increase five times to reach those targets is one of the options. And in order to increase five times, I am going to give this and this incentive to uh, the industry, to the, uh, to the consumers, to the people who will buy it. So we need to see these credible policies, electric cars. I want to see that the electric cars uh, will, a uh, number of electric cars in my country will need to be increasing by 10 times. So what? So therefore, I have to give some incentives for the people buying electric cars. I am going to put the charging systems. So this is the, the second layer. We want to be sure that this is happening. The, credible legs to reach those targets. And the other layer, last layer is, we are going to track what they are doing. I mean, to uh, target is good, policies is uh, better, but the best is to see that they are implementing those policies. Because I have seen many policies put in place, but not implemented in the right way. So our job is working with the governments to put the right energy policies, credible energy policies, and at the same time to see whether or not they are implementing those policies, tracking their activities. Thank you very much. Um, so now on the theme of geopolitics, how can the increasingly polarized world between the US and China collaborate for climate action? <clears throat> So I, first of all, I really hope uh, that the U.S. and China uh, difficulties between those or differences between those countries uh, will be uh, minimized. I am sure there will be challenges uh, between those two very important economic powers in the world. But when it comes to climate change, one ton of CO2 coming from Shanghai will have the same effect on New York or one ton of CO2 coming from Detroit will have the same effect on, on Beijing population. So uh, the emissions don't have a passport. So uh, at least on this topic, I hope to see a cooperation between the United States and uh, China, number one and number two biggest emitters uh, of the world. And uh, I hope that the next uh, U.S. administration will join back to uh, Paris Agreement, and this will be an important uh, uh, milestone in a possible better U.S.-China relationship to address the climate issues. Sure, thank you. Um, do you think, um, as the energy tr transition takes place, do you see other forms of energy taking up the geopolitical role that oil plays today? Yes, uh, there will be um, more and more we will see, especially in transportation sector, electricity will be a part of the game. And when I say electricity, uh, this is not only for the cars, but maybe in the future with the buses and even with the uh, trucks. And in general, the clean energy uh, uh, technologies may need some uh, materials or rare earths, uh, which are uh, concentrated in a very few number of countries. Now, 
we are uh, we know that this is a serious issue but we don't know how serious it is so to understand it to analyze it we are carrying out a major global study to tell the world whether or not this will be a challenge for the economy namely the demand for one of the uh, rare earths uh, goes up if there is not enough supply prices go up and it solves the problem because of more uh, production will come or this will be a geopolitical uh, uh, problem and uh, we will uh, see how this report uh, will look like with the several uh, worldwide known experts we are carrying out this study we will come up uh, next uh, year uh, beginning of next year but uh, my anticipation is uh, the the difficulties we have in terms of the uh, oil and geopolitics we may well see in a different context in the case of the clean energy transitions implications and the availability of certain critical materials thank you very much um so now given COVID-19 has caused COP26 to be delayed by a year, um, what now needs to be achieved in, in COP26, given you said this decade is the most critical? So I have uh, great hopes for COP26 uh, for the following reason, and I have at least uh, two uh, reasons. One, which US uh, likely to come back to Paris Agreement, there will be a tremendous uh, momentum, political momentum. This is very important. Political momentum means uh, that the many investors around the world will understand that the direction is changing because US is the most, uh, the biggest economic power in the, in the world and the direction is uh, changing and uh, the investors uh, uh, go put their money there where they think uh, where the uh, highest returns uh, will come from rather than it is climate it is uh, best uh, wishes it is just the money and when they see that the direction is going in that direction the us is the leading this climate uh, uh, um, dossier it will go there this is the one reason political momentum is growing second and this is important, especially for the maybe the colleagues who are studying uh, engineering, technology, and so on. Now, 2050, the emission reductions, the 50% of the emission reductions needed to reach 2050 net zero, 50% of it, will need to come from technologies which are today commercially not available. There, it is in the labs, it is in the, the demonstration phase and everything. And then the magic word here is the uh, innovation. And the United States has been the center of innovation energy technologies decades and decades. I believe the next administration may be a big driver of the huge flow of R&D, research and development money, and accelerate the clean energy technologies that are not ready for market yet, but to, to, in order to mature them out, they are going to put money, and the, uh, this uh, will be a big, big, big uh, push for the next technologies to come. So putting these two things together, the uh, political momentum coming from US, innovation led by US, but of course, Europe, Japan, China, all the countries together. I, I think next year we will go to COP26 uh, in Glasgow uh, in a good shape. And my expectation, I told the, <coughs> the UK minister uh, yesterday, Paris Agreement we had, this is the fifth year of Paris Agreement, and uh, I told him that Paris is known to be the city of light, okay? And I expect and I hope that the lights in Glasgow 
will be brighter than in Paris uh, in the uh, to, uh, next year because I expect strong commitment will come from many countries around the world, which will mean that the agreement in Glasgow may even uh, overclock what happened in Paris 2015. This is my hope, and I have, I have also great uh, confidence in the UK uh, civil servants. Uh, they, are, they are excellent uh, colleagues, diplomats, and I am sure they will be able to come with an ambitious uh, plan from Glasgow. Thank you. Um, I think this, this follows on well, but and you mentioned R&D investment, but um, what do you think are the most important actions that the US can take to incentivize the rest of the world to step up their climate actions and pledges? I think uh, there are, in order to reach our uh, climate targets, there are uh, technologies which are already with us, such as solar, such as uh, uh, wind, such as efficiency measures, but we still need uh, other clean energy technologies to be part of the game. As I said, electricity. Electricity will need to be a part of the many, many different solutions. And when we look at today, uh, solar growing, wind growing, it is good, but it is helping to decarbonize our power system, which is a good news. But there are other parts of the, uh, our energy system where emissions come from, where it is difficult to use solar and wind. For example, cement, production of cement, or cars. So uh, therefore, currently today, we have a lot, uh, most of the 99% of the cars in the world are internal combustion engines. How we are going to make sure that the number of electric cars will increase and in our, uh, with our numbers to reach 2050, our uh, uh, climate targets in 2030, only 10 years of time, every second car sold in the world should be electric car every second car. And today it is less than 2% of the cars, electric cars. So therefore, uh, uh, we expect the US in terms of batteries, for example, in terms of the hydrogen electrolyzers, they help the world to accelerate the innovation by pushing the uh, R&D, research and development button. This is my, there are many expectations, of course, everybody has a uh, a list uh, a, a wish from the US government, but my expectation is, if I have to choose one of them, the innovation of clean energy technologies. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll make this one, this one of my last questions. Um, with the significant impact of COVID-19 on the oil and gas industry, as you've mentioned, um, peak oil demand forecasts are moving closer and with the global energy transition, what do you think OPEC countries will do and should do going forward? I think uh, our numbers show that in any reasonable scenario in the future, uh, the value of oil will go down. The value of oil uh, for the countries, namely the amount of oil required will be less, and the price of oil uh, will be lower. So therefore your revenues of those countries are uh, much, much uh, lower than they had in the past. And there are many countries in Middle East, in Latin America, in Africa, whose economies are almost 90%, 95% indexed to oil and gas uh, revenues. And this is the uh, highest time for them to start to diversify. Otherwise, first their economy will be badly affected. And second, uh, their social lives of their people and maybe political stability. So therefore uh, diversification is the uh, key word uh, here, which we said before, but not much happened except for one or two countries uh, because uh, now it is very serious, uh, not only for those uh, countries, but also 
oil and gas companies, I tell them that the no oil and gas company, no oil and gas country will be unaffected from the clean energy transitions. So they have to uh, they have to take this into account. Thank you very much. Um, and this is my final question. Um, according to the IEA 2020 uh, World Energy Investment Report, there is an expected 20% drop in global energy investment expected this year. Um, how will this impact the clean energy projects and the transition? So uh, we are seeing uh, in some cases it is a definitely a, a negative effect, especially wind and uh, solar, but this effect is not as damaging as bad as the effect on uh, oil, gas, and coal. For example, let me tell you one thing on solar. When we look at today, the world, all the power plants installed this year in the world, 50% is solar, other 50% is all others put together. Coal plus gas uh, plus oil plus nuclear plus even wind, hydro, 50%. Solar alone, 50%. Why? Is it because uh, suddenly all the countries are pushing climate change? No. It is because solar is now the cheapest source of electricity generation in most parts of the world. And when we look at the future, solar will grow very strongly, because, be, mainly because it is cheaper. And second, it also enjoys, in some countries, uh, government support. So, and it is the reason I have uh, nicknamed solar as the new king of global power markets. It is the new king. The coal was the old king. Solar is the new king because it is going to grow very, very uh, strongly. And I believe solar investments, wind investments, they had a, 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 a pushback in 2020. They're a bit lower. 2021, still coming back, but after 2022, they will go still uh, very strong. Thank you very much. I'll, um, I'll move on to the audience questions now. So um, our first one is, in the World Energy Outlook 2019, fossil fuels still have a share of 58% in the 2040 sustainable development scenario. So does this mean they will remain vital for decades to come and still need investment? Is, is this correct? So fossil fuels, there are fossil fuels and fossil fuels. Coal is different than gas, gas is different than uh, oil. Uh, today, the share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix is 80%, eight zero. And 30 years ago, it was still 80%. We should acknowledge that the fossil fuels are very stubborn. Why they are stubborn? Because they are, it's convenient to use them. There is a convenience thing. If with solar and wind, we have a lot of uh, challenges in terms of, for example, we don't know when there is sun, when there is no sun. We don't know when there is wind, we don't know wind. But if you put uh, oil and gas and coal, uh, it is with you uh, all the time. But of course, it has many, many disadvantages. So in terms of uh, coal, we think we are going to see it is already in a terminal decline. Having said that, today, coal still has the largest share in the global electricity uh, generation, but it's a terminal decline. Gas will replace more and more uh, coal, but gas will be with us and the share of oil will decline. And of the fossil fuels, that those will be with us uh, in next decades to come, they should be equipped with the carbon capture and storage technology so that their emissions are uh, minimized, if not uh, nullified. So uh, my expectation is there will be still oil, there will be still gas, less than their share will be less than today, for sure. But the coal will go down uh, substantially. And the fossil fuels we have should be uh, equipped with carbon capture and storage technologies. Thank you. Um, another question um, is saying, we, we know coal in China is not as economically attractive as renewables. 
but there is still 40 plus gigawatts of new coal capacity in the pipeline for development in 2020. How do we remedy this? So China is a very important, very good, and a very good question, like your questions. Uh, now, China is the largest emitter of the world. If China is not able to reach its climate targets, whatever the rest of the world does, it doesn't matter. We will not never be able to reach our climate targets, full stop, full stop. Uh, now, and China today, of all the coal consumption in the world, entire coal con consumption in the world, half of them are consumed in China, other half, all the rest of the world put together. So China has the half of the coal in the world used. Now, one more statistics I want to give you on China to understand a bit the, why uh, your question, green recovery, is so critical. Uh, because I told you that the emissions this year went down. And if you do not put the right green recovery policies, it, they will go up with the economic recovery. This was my theory since uh, six months. And now I have a proof, which is the China. China is a test drive for everything because COVID started in China. We all know that. The first lockdown was in China. We all know that. Then we know that the Chinese economy get a big hit. But after that, China was the first country which got out of the lockdown. Chinese economy rebounded. And today, I have the numbers. Chinese emissions 2020 now rebounded. And they are higher than 2019. So all the 7% decline. And this is, again, comes to your colleague's question. Policies didn't change, 40 gigawatts, if not higher, new coal capacity is added, and this is not enough. In China and elsewhere, not to add, this is very critical, this is a blind spot of the old climate debate. The issue is not only, I, I hope my English will be uh, 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 clear enough now. The issue is not only not to add anything polluting, but also, we have a legacy locked in infrastructure, coal plants, cement, uh, the, the iron steel uh, fabrics, which are run by fossil fuels. And if we don't touch them, if they continue with their normal economic lifetime, they will already close the door for reaching our uh, climate targets. So we have two jobs. What we built new, shouldn't be dirty. Second, what we have inherited, the legacy locked in infrastructure need to be cured, either shut down a, a phase out or uh, making more uh, efficient. We have two jobs and uh, two jobs for everybody, including uh, China. Thank you very much. Um... The next question, um, what is the most impactful actions individuals, households, businesses, and communities can do to facilitate the transition? Now, uh, first of all, choose the good government. Give the, choose the right ones because uh, individuals can make a lot of uh, uh, right moves taking a bicycle or uh, not to eat this, not to do this. These are all very good, morally very nice, but the order of magnitude of the challenge is so big that we need collective big responses and governments here and the, in the uh, driving seat. We may in Europe sacrifice from some of our uh, habits change the habits, but the world is very big. We may well uh, sacrifice in London or in Paris or, or New York not to uh, eat uh, uh, exotic fruits from uh, Costa Rica, but there are hundreds of millions of people in Asia need to buy their first refrigerator, first air conditioner, and uh, 
and the first wash machine, which are going to consume energy. So therefore, the issue is we can change our uh, habits, forget the, we can easily forget uh, eating uh, ananas from Costa Rica, but this is not enough. There is a huge poverty in the world, and they will buy their first air conditioners, first refrigerators. Therefore, there should be a mechanism with the all governments around the world uh, pushing the right energy policies. But this doesn't mean that we should just sit back and uh, just wait. We should make our best in terms of having a sustainable uh, uh, lifestyle. I can give you an example from myself, uh, dear. I am, uh, I am 62 years old and I never ever bought a car. I use the public transport and walking. So uh, this is a matter of principle. Uh, and uh, I would advise all uh, young colleagues, uh, not only for energy, climate change, but what you say and what you do, if they are, they may not be the same. It's very difficult if they are the same, but if they are at least close to each other, uh, you are a better person. Thank you. Um, so we have five minutes left, so I'll do the last couple of questions um, before we finish. Um, so the hydrogen economy is being touted as the, the next big thing in the energy market, but countries are rather slow to embrace it and there are multiple technical challenges. How can we change this reality? So uh, I have been working on energy issues, uh, at least in the last uh, three decades. I have, I have never seen any technology that all the governments agree this is the technology of the future. When you say carbon capture and storage, some people like it, some others don't. When you say nuclear, some like it, others dislike it. When you say, I don't know, electric cars, some love it, others laugh at that. But when it comes to hydrogen, all the countries love hydrogen around the world and the companies. I have another, another hat, I am the chair of Davos World Economic Forum on uh, energy uh, issues and all the companies are there. I see all the companies love hydrogen. Now, love is good, but again, we want to see what is the action. So we have to see that the governments come up with a good strategy and put money in the hydrogen and especially bring the cost down. This is the biggest uh, issue. And in hydrogen, there is a part of the system which we call electrolyzer, the cost of electrolyzer needs to come down. And this is not a big, uh, very complicated uh, 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 equipment, just by mass manufacturing, by uh, learning, by doing, we can bring the cost down. But to do that, some governments need to give subsidies, push this technology, mass manufacturing, like we have done for the solar. 10 years ago, solar energy was expensive. Governments gave a kick, uh, the first uh, uh, kick of subsidies, and now it is uh, much uh, cheaper, as I said. The same thing can happen in, uh, in hydrogen, and I believe hydrogen may well be here today uh, where solar was 10 years ago. Thank you very much. Um, so final question. Um, what kind of policy mechanisms can be implemented in emerging economies, um, such as South Africa, who tran whose transition to clean energy is heavily affected by the financial situation? So, uh, to be very frank, I wouldn't put the, in terms of the fight against climate change, I wouldn't put the African countries in the same basket, such as the, for example, European countries. So Africa, uh, because emissions, climate change is a, a result of the cumulative emissions in the last 100 years. The share of Africa in the cumulative emissions globally is uh, less than 2%. Yet Africa will have the biggest hit of climate if there's a climate change, extreme weather events, droughts and uh, others. So uh, if there are some uh, 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 countries which need to receive some support in terms of uh, clean energy technology push, I think this is the, these are the African countries. You tell about, uh, talk about South Africa. South Africa today, the big chunk of the South Africa electricity comes from coal. And coal is at the same time, 
one of the biggest source of employment. If you cut coal today, you will leave uh, millions of people unemployed. How are you going to have a just, inclusive transition to clean energy is a key issue. It will not happen only with sending tweets left, tweets right, having a walking here, talking about this. It requires a very careful design of clean energy transition. I mentioned to you that I was with the uh, several uh, energy ministers of Africa, which was in fact hosted by the South African uh, energy minister and myself. I can assure you that the South Africa is very keen to push solar energy and as mr minister said gradually replace uh, coal we should be a bit tolerant with the african countries i cannot put south africa or uh, ethiopia in the same basket with the sweden or uh, switzerland or other countries we have to be a bit fair uh, here in terms of their problems they are facing in those countries thank you very much um thank you for all your time. I, I guess I'll just say, is there any final remarks you'd like to leave our viewers with? So uh, please, uh, I guess if I'm uh, not uh, wrong, dear, most of the colleagues who are listening to us are students. Yep. So uh, I don't know if they are going to choose their uh, profession, uh, what they are going to do in life, or some of them did, but you might choose and go back left and right. But so. My uh, suggestion is this is a very important choice. One of the top three choices you make in life, uh, your uh, partner, your profession, and your football team. So this is the, and I hope uh, that they, they choose the right profession. What is the right profession? What I have experienced my, based on my humble experience, what makes you happy? What makes you happy? What makes you go to work in the morning? Oh, I am so happy I am going to go to work. I will do this, I will do that. Rather than, oh, I am going to work again, but I have to go because of the salary I am going to get. Uh, it may seem too idealistic, but uh, I think it is, the, in my view, uh, 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 part of the happiness uh, in life. Thank you so much for those perfect words to end on. And thank you ever so much for taking the time. We are extremely grateful. Um, thank you. And um, thank you to everyone who watched at home. Um, I hope you really enjoyed this absolutely fantastic session. Thank you so much, Dr. Barol. Thank um, you very much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.